Friendship is so tightly linked to the definition of philosophy that it can be said that without it, philosophy would not really be possible. The intimacy between friendship and philosophy is so profound that philosophy contains the philos, the friend, in its very name, and as often happens with such an excessive proximity, the risk runs high of not making heads or tails of it. In the classical world, this promiscuity, this near consubstantiality of the friend and the philosopher was taken as a given. It is certainly with a somewhat archaizing intent, then, that a contemporary philosopher, when posing the extreme question, what is philosophy, was able to write that this is a question to be discussed entre amis, between friends. Today, the relationship between friendship and philosophy has actually fallen into discredit, and it is with a kind of embarrassment and bad conscience that professional philosophers try to come to terms with this uncomfortable and, as it were, clandestine partner of their thought. Many years ago, my friend Jean-Luc Nancy and I had decided to exchange some letters on the theme of friendship. We were persuaded that this was the best way of drawing closer to, almost staging, a problem that otherwise seemed to resist analytical treatment. I wrote the first letter and awaited his response, not without trepidation. This is not the place to attempt to comprehend what reasons, or perhaps what misunderstandings, signaled the end of the project upon the arrival of Jean-Luc's letter. <clears throat> but it is certain that our friendship, which we assumed would open up a privileged point of access to the problem, was instead an obstacle, and that it was in some measure, at least temporarily, obscured. It is an analogous and probably conscious sense of discomfort that led Jacques Derrida to choose as a leitmotif for his book on friendship a sibylline motto attributed to Aristotle by tradition that negates friendship with the very same gesture by which it seems to invoke it. O philoi odious philos, odious philos. O friends, there are no friends. One of the themes of the book is, in fact, the critique of what the author defines as the phallocentric notion of friendship that has dominated philosophical and our philosophical and political tradition. When Derrida was still working on the lecture that would be the origin of the book, we discussed together a curious philological problem concerning the motto or quip in question. It can be found in Montaigne and in Nietzsche, both of whom would have taken it from Diogenes Laertius. But if we open a modern edition of the latter's Lives of Eminent Philosophers, to the chapter dedicated to Aristotle's biography, 521, we do not find the phrase in question, but rather one to all appearances almost identical, whose significance is nevertheless different and much less mysterious. Oi, omega with oida subscript, philoi, odeus, philos. He who has many friends, does not have a single friend. A visit to the library was all it took to clarify the mystery. In 1616, a new edition of The Lives appeared, edited by the great Genevan philologist Isaac Casabon. Reaching the passage in question, which still read, O Philoi, O Friends, and the edition established by his father-in-law, Henri Etienne, or Henri Estienne, however it's pronounced, Casaubon, without any hesitation, corrected the enigmatic lesson of the manuscripts, which then became so perfectly intelligible that it was taken up by modern editors. Since I had immediately informed Derrida of the results of my research, I was stunned not to find any trace 
of the second reading, when his book Politique de l'Amitié was published, if the motto, apocryphal, according to modern philologists, was reproduced in the original form, it certainly was not due to forgetfulness. It was essential to the book's strategy that friendship would at once be affirmed and revoked. In this sense, Derrida's gesture is a repetition of Nietzsche's. When he was still a student of philology, Nietzsche had begun a work on the sources of Diogenes Laertius's book. And so the textual history of the lives, hence also Casaubon's amendment, must have been perfectly known to him. Nevertheless, the necessity of friendship and at the same time, a certain distrust of friends were essential to Nietzsche's philosophical strategy. Hence, his recourse to the traditional lesson that was already out of date by Nietzsche's time. Ubner's 1828 edition adopts the modern version, adding the annotation, Legabitur o philoi, amendavit casu bonus. Two. It is possible that the peculiar semantic status of the term friend has contributed to the discomfort of modern philosophers. It is common knowledge that no one has ever been able to satisfactorily define the meaning of the syntam, I love you. So much is this the case that one might think that it has a performative character, that its meaning, in other words, coincides with the act of its utterance. Analogous considerations could be made regarding the expression, I am your friend, although recourse to the performative category seems impossible here. I maintain rather that friend belongs to the class of terms that linguists define as non-predicative. These are terms from which it is not possible to establish a class that includes all the things to which the predicate in question is attributed. White, hard, or hot are certainly predicative terms, but it is possible to say that friend is it possible to say that friend defines a consistent class in the above sense. As strange as it might seem, Friend shares this quality with another type of non-predicative term, insults. Linguists have demonstrated that insults do not offend those who are subjected to them as a result of including the insulted person in a particular category, for example, that of excrement or the male or female sexual organs, depending on the language, something that would simply be impossible or anyway false. An insult is effective precisely because it does not function as a constitutive utterance, but rather as a proper noun. In other words, because it uses language in order to give a name in such a way that the named cannot accept his name, and against which he cannot defend himself, as if someone were to insist on calling me Gaston, knowing that my name is Giorgio, what is offensive in the insult is... In other words, a pure experience of language and not a reference to the world. If this is true, friend shares its condition not only with insults, but also with philosophical terms. Terms that, as is well known, do not possess an objective denotation. And like those terms that medieval logicians define as transcendental, simply signify being. Three, in the collection of the Galleria Nazionale di Arte Antica in Rome, there is a painting by Giovanni Serradini that represents the meaning of the apostles Peter and Paul on the road to their martyrdom. The two saints, immobile, occupy the center of the canvas, surrounded by the wild gesticulations of the soldiers and executioners who are leading them to their torment. <clears throat> Critics have often remarked on the contrast between the heroic fortitude of the two apostles and the tumult of the crowd. 
highlighted here and there by drops of light splashed about almost at random on arms, faces, and trumpets. As far as I am concerned, I maintain that what renders this painting genuinely incomparable is that Saradini has depicted the two apostles so close to each other, their foreheads are almost stuck together, that there is no way that they can see one another. <clears throat> On the road to martyrdom, they look at each other without recognizing one another. This impression of a nearness that is, so to speak, excessive is enhanced by the silent gesture of the barely visible shaking hands at the bottom of the painting. The painting has always seemed to me to be a perfect allegory of friendship. Indeed, what is friendship other than a proximity that resists both representation and conceptualization? To recognize someone as a friend means not being able to recognize him as a something. <clears throat> calling someone friend is not the same as calling him white, Italian, or hot, since friendship is neither a property nor a quality of a subject. Four. But it is now time to begin reading the passage by Aristotle that I was planning to comment on. The philosopher dedicates to the subject of friendship a treatise which comprises the eighth and ninth books of the Nicomachean Ethics. Since we are dealing here with one of the most celebrated and widely discussed texts in the entire history of philosophy, I shall assume your familiarity with its well-known theses. That we cannot live without friends. That we need to distinguish between a friendship based on utility or on pleasure and virtuous friendship, where the friend is loved as such. That it is not possible to have many friends, that a distant friendship tends to lead to oblivion, and so on. These points are common knowledge. There is, though, a passage in the treatise that seems to me to have received insufficient attention even though it contains, so to speak, the ontological basis of Aristotle's theory of friendship. I am referring to the 1170A28 to 1171B35 passage. <clears throat> Let's read it together. He who sees senses anesthetai, that he is seeing. He who hears senses that he is hearing. He who walks senses that he is walking and thus for all the other activities. There is something that senses that we are exerting them. Hoti energumen, hoti energumen. <clears throat> In such a way that if we sense, we sense that we are sensing, and if we think, we sense that we are thinking. This is the same thing <clears throat> as sensing existence, existing, to enai, enai, to enai, which means in fact sensing and thinking. Sensing that we are alive is in and of itself sweet, for life is by nature good, and it is sweet to sense that such a good belongs to us. Living is desirable, above all for those who are good, since for them existing is a good and sweet thing. For good men, consenting, synesthenomonai, sensing together, <clears throat> feel sweet because they recognize the good itself. And what a good man feels with respect to himself, he also feels with respect to his friend. The friend is, in fact, an other self, heteros otos. And as all people find the fact of their own existence, to oton ienai, desirable, the existence of their friends is equally, or almost equally, desirable. Existence is desirable because one senses that it is a good thing, and this sensation, aesthesis, is in itself sweet. <clears throat> one must, therefore, also consent that his friend exists. And this happens by living together and by sharing acts and thoughts in common, kunoinen, 
In this sense, we say that humans live together, Sizen, unlike cattle that share the pasture together. Friendship is, in fact, a community, and as we are with respect to ourselves, so we are, as well, with respect to our friends. And as the sensation of existing, Aesthesis Ahuti Estin, is desirable for us, so would it also be for our friends. Five. We are dealing here with an extraordinarily dense passage. Because Aristotle enunciates a few theses of first philosophy that will not recur in this form in any of his other writings. One. We are dealing here with an extraordinarily dense passage because Aristotle enunciates a few theses of first philosophy that will not recur in this form in any of his other writings. One. There is a sensation of pure being, an aesthesis of existence. Aristotle repeats this point several times by mobilizing the technical vocabulary of ontology. As thenometha oti esmen, as thesis oti estin, the oti estin is existence, the quod est, insofar as it opposes essence, <coughs> quid est, t estin. Two, this sensation of existing is in itself sweet, hades, or hedis. Three, there is an equivalence between being and living between sensing one's existence and sensing one's life. It is a decided anticipation of the Nietzschean thesis that states, being, we have no other way of imagining it apart from living. An analogous, if more generic claim, can be found in De Anima 415b13. Being for the living is life. Four. Within this sensation of existing, there is another sensation, specifically a human one, that takes the form of a joint sensation or a consent. Synesthis. <coughs> Synes. Thanesthai. Synesthanesthai. Synesthanesthai. With the existence of the friend. Friendship is the instance of this consentiment, of the existence of the friend within the sentiment of existence itself. But this means that friendship has an ontological and political status. The sensation of being is in fact always already both divided and condivided, condivisa, shared. And friendship is the name of this condivision. This sharing has nothing whatsoever to do with the modern chimera of intersubjectivity, the relationship between subjects. Rather, being itself is divided here. It is non-identical to itself. And so the I and the friend are the two faces or the two poles of this condivision or sharing. Five. The friend is, therefore, an other self a heteros autos. Through its Latin translation, alter ego, this expression has had a long history, which cannot be reconstructed here. But it is important to note that the Greek formulation is much more pregnant with meaning than what is understood by the modern ear. First and foremost, Greek, like Latin, has two terms for alterity. Allos, Latin alias, is generic alterity, while well, heteros, Latin alter is alterity in the sense of an opposition between two, as in heterogeneity. More often, the Latin ego geneity? Moreover, the Latin ego is not an exact translation of autos, which means self. 
The friend is not another I, but an otherness eminent to selfness, a becoming other of the self. The point at which I perceive my existence as sweet, my sensation goes through a consenting, which dislocates and deports my sensation toward the friend, toward the other self. Friendship is this desubjectification at the very heart of the most intimate sensation of the self. Six. <clears throat> At this point, we can take the ontological status of friendship in Aristotle's philosophy as a given. Friendship belongs to the prote philosophia. Since the same experience, the same sensation of being is what is at stake in both. One therefore comprehends why friend cannot be a real predicate added to a concept in order to be admitted to a certain class. Using modern terms, one could say that friend is an existential and not a categorial. But this existential, which as such cannot be conceptualized, is still infused with an intensity that charges it with something like political potentiality. This intensity is the sin, the con, or the with that divides, disseminates, and renders shareable. Actually, it has always been shared. The same sensation, the same sweetness of existing. That this sharing or condivision has for Aristotle a political significance is implied in a passage in the text that I have already analyzed and to which it is opportune to return. One must therefore also consent, consent that his friend exists. And this happens by living together, the sizen, by sharing acts and thoughts in common, koinonin. In this sense, we say that humans live together, unlike cattle that share the pasture together. The expression that we have rendered as share the pasture together is entoi artoi nemesthai. But the verb nemo, which as you know, is rich with political implications, it is enough to think of the diverbative nomos, also means in the middle voice partaking. And so the Aristotelian expression could simply stand for partaking in the same. It is essential at any rate that the human community comes to be defined here in contrast to the animal community through a living together Sizen acquires here a technical meaning that is not defined by the participation in a common substance, but rather by a sharing that is purely existential, a condivision that, so to speak, lacks an object. Friendship as the consentment of the pure fact of being. Friends do not share something, birth, law, place, taste. They are shared by the experience of friendship. Friendship is the condivision that pre precedes every division, since what has to be shared is the very fact of existence, life itself. And it is this sharing without an object, this original consenting, that constitutes the political. How this originary political synesthesia became over time the consensus to which democracies today entrust their fate in this last extreme and exhausted phase of their evolution is, as they say, another story which I leave you to reflect on.